Hey, yeah, my name is Danielle. I'm an SHO who works at Withenshaw. I'm going to be doing a chat today on being asked to see a patient with confusion or reduced GCS. Just a brief overview of what we're going to go through. We're going to talk mainly about how to assess the patient presenting with confusion or reduced GCS when you've been asked to go and see them. Um, the key differentials in this patient, and we're going to talk more in more detail about some of the differentials and then the kind of acute management that as an F1 you'd need to initiate after reviewing a patient with confusion or reduced GCS. So first to talk about assessing conscious level, the term GCS, which I'm sure you all know, the Glasgow Coma Scale, looks at eyes, verbal and motor. You can use this when we see a patient to give an objective measurement of how conscious they are. However, if you want a more gross measurement, something you can do a bit quick, more quickly would be an AFPU score, which now has a C in it for confusion. Um, so whether the patient is alert, confused, alert to voice, alert to pain, or completely unresponsive. And again, this is helpful when you're doing your assessment to know where the patient sits on that scale. So we are gonna talk about how to assess a patient with confusion. However, I think because there's so many differential diagnoses to talk about with a patient with confusion or reduced GCS. I think it's helpful to be able to work backwards from what we think it might be going on to try and frame our assessment. So confusion or reduced GCS can be a presentation in near enough every medical problem across all the different systems. So this is just divided into different systems, but it's obviously not an exhaustive list. So in terms of chest, hypoxia or hypercapnia can cause drowsiness, or confusion, and a pneumonia, as with any infection, can lead to a confusion. Cardiovascular hypovolemia caused by of any cause of so dehydration or shock. An ACS or arrhythmias can cause confusion or reduce GCS. Neurological, so ones to think about would be an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, any seizures in the post-seizure period when the patient's post-ictal, this can cause drowsiness or confusion, or kind of partial seizures or non-epileptic status where the patient may not be responsive but isn't actually actively seizing. And then CNS infection, meningitis or encephalitis. Gastro causes malnutrition and subsequent vitamin deficiencies. And alongside that, a lot of electrolyte disturbances can cause confusion and hepatic encephalopathy can give you reduced GCS. And then a lot of systemic causes, so near enough every infection can result in a confusion. Um, hypo or hyperglycemia, toxins, be that drugs, alcohol, or something we give to the patient, iatrogenic causes, um, as I mentioned, electrolyte disturbance, and then renal failure result in a uremia, or psychiatric causes such as psychosis. Now, this is quite a big list, as I said, not exhaustive, but could be quite overwhelming to look at. But a term that often encompasses the end point of a lot of these problems would be a delirium, so termed an acute confusional state. And a lot of the causes of delirium are kind of some of these conditions. A lot of these conditions could cause a delirium. So we're going to talk particularly about delirium in itself in more detail. So there's a pinch me acronym to describe the possible causes of a delirium, things that contribute to it. A key one being infection, but also pain, constipation, poor hydration, new medications, and in a very elderly, frail patient who might already have a dementia, something as simple as a change in the environment can cause a delirium or an acute drop in the GCS. Alongside that, other things we're going to think about and look at in more detail are neurological causes, so particularly an acute, acute intracranial event. This is something that could happen to a patient while in hospital. 
that you would be ex expected to assess and pick up. So we can think about them as ischemic or hemorrhagic. And then in terms of hemorrhagic strokes, you've got your spontaneous intracerebral bleeds and also your one caused by trauma. We're also going to touch on an important differential that we don't forget, um, which is hypoglycemia. So don't ever forget glucose. And we'll touch on the management of that at the end. So I want us to try and keep particularly the cause of delirium in mind. And then the fact that it could be something intracerebral when we're going through the assessment and the management of the patient, because that'll really help us determine what we're looking for in the assessment. Go back to being asked to see the patient. So you get a call from a nurse on a ward when you're the F1 on call saying, would you be able to come and review this patient? They're very confused. This is new. I just leave a few seconds. People can try and think about what they'd ask the nurse on the phone, what more information they would ask for and anything they would ask for before they arrive on the ward. Okay, so the key things to ask, you probably want a little bit more detail other than just newly confused, but particularly is this confusion new or old? Have the patient come in with confusion or if they suddenly developed it on the ward that day or the reduced GCS as well as confusion? And then you want a full set of observations other than that conscious level to determine how unwell the patient is. Particularly important because as we talked about, a lot of the kind of serious medical illnesses is what can result in a new confusion or reduced GCS. So we want a full set heart rate, blood pressure, SATs, RESPs and temperature while you're going to go to see the patient. And then for a more objective measure, we can ask the nurse and staff if they know the GCS of the patient or if not, the AVPU status, and that'll just help give you a measure of how alert or not alert the patient is. Now we'll talk about what we wanted to, would want to ask in the history. It's worth saying that with a confused patient, it would be very difficult to get a good history from them or if their GCS is very low. So a lot of your history is going to come from the medical notes, from the nurse and staff, or if they're a new admission from family members. So while we're taking the history, we want to keep in mind these differentials that we've got here, and that can help frame what we ask. So in the history presented and complaint and the initial collateral history, we want to know how new this drop in GCS is, how long it's been going on for, is it up and down or is it gradually declining? And then we want a full systems review, kind of a top to toe review of any possible other symptoms the patients had leading up to this confusion that have been noticed by family or by nurse and staff. So any features of any infection in any system and then any neurological symptoms, specifically if we're thinking about stroke, we want to know had the patient had any notice weakness, visual problems or speech disturbance prior to their drop in GCS. Other things it's important to know is if the patient has had any recent falls, plus minus head injuries to help quantify how well we will be that this could be a bleed. The next thing to ask, especially if the patient's been in a little while, um, is to have a look at the notes and ask the nurse and staff what they came in with, what we've treated them for so far, particularly new medications, and then their fluid status and are they opening their bowels? Because as we said, things like constipation, poor hydration could be causes of developing a delirium. So we can find those out from the notes, but we find them out from the nurse and the staff. The next thing we're going to look at is past medical history. Key thing is previous confusion. So a history of dementia or a previous delirium increases your risk of developing a new delirium. We want to know if the patient's had a stroke or a bleed before because that will increase their risk of this happening again. Alongside thinking about ischemic stroke, we want to know their vascular risk factors. So other than have they had a stroke with TIA before, we'll be thinking about do they have ischemic heart disease, high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, 
any history of recurrent infections that can often be associated with the delirium. So patients who get recurrent UTIs, their families will tell you they get confused every time they have a urine infection. And this is important to know because it does just help frame what you think might be going on. And then thinking about uh, hypo or hyperglycemia, whether the patient has a history of diabetes and whether they're on insulin for that. The next thing we're going to think about is their drug history. So important features of the drug history we want to know is anticoagulation or antiplatelets in the context of thinking about possible intracerebral bleeds. And then any culprit medications that are known to cause confusion, particularly in elderly patients. So new opiates, benzos, or any antimuscarinic drugs are important to know. They might be the cause of the new confusion or at least contribute into it. In their social history, we want to know whether the patient drinks any alcohol at home. Quite, also, quite significant if they've just come into hospital for worried about alcohol withdrawal or whether they're at risk of word because of course coughs. We're then thinking about any drug misuse, particularly when they've just come into hospital. Could they be intoxicated? And this is the reason why they're confused. And then, especially for an elderly patient, we want to know their baseline. Do they live in a care home or their own home? And are they known to have falls or are they a falls risk? Uh, and were they supervised before they came into hospital? An elderly patient with a very low GCS who lives on their own at home would be quite worried that they'd had a fall that we didn't know about and then a subsequent bleed. So just important to get take a good social history or at least find out from the family or from the nursing staff what the patient was like before they came in and how worried we should be that they've had a fall before they came in. The next thing we'll talk about is examining the patient. So we're going to do it in an A to E structure as you would for any unwell patient that you go to review. So in airway and breathing, airway, we're thinking about looking to see if there's any additional noises or any snoring, if there's a significant reduction in the GCS. So GCS less than eight, intubate. Once the GCS is less than eight, the patient is unlikely to be protecting their own airway. If you're worried about the airway when you see them as an F1, you could put an oropharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal airway in um, to protect that while you're waiting for further help. In terms of breathing, we're going to think about looking at their sats and their resps. This will help us determine how unwell the patient is in terms of any possible infection, particularly a pneumonia. And we know that hypoxia, as we mentioned before, can cause reduced, can cause reduced GCS. So if they have low sats, we're going to treat them with some oxygen. And then we're going to have a listen, um, particularly for crep suggestive infection or for any evidence of heart failure. In C, we're going to want their blood pressure and heart rate, cap refill time fluid status. This is all tying into hypovolemia being a cause of a reduced GCS. And that could be because the patient is has poor intake and is dehydrated, or because the patient has hypovolemia due to a sepsis. We're going to have a feel of their pulse its volume and rhythm and a regular pulse would raise suspicion of AF which might make you worry in the context of stroke or a fast EF might make you worry about infection and sepsis and then we're going to have a listen to their heart sounds. In D it's particularly important given the presentation so we're going to document their GCS or their this point on the AVPU scale have a look at their pupils. We want to know that they're equal and reactive. Unequal pupils would raise concern of a raised intracranial pressure. Particularly small pupils might make you think about opiate toxicity. Um, and large pupils might make you think about other drug misuse if it's a new patient in the ward. We're then going to do a cranial nerve exam and an upper and lower limb exam of the motor system as best we can in a very confused patient or a patient with a significantly reduced GCS, it would be difficult to do a full comprehensive neurological exam. But here we're we'll looking for any obvious signs of any focal neurological deficit. So any dense hemiparesis, any facial droop, and any speech disturbance noted if the patient can still talk to you. And these are important things in the context of thinking about possible stroke. I'm going to have a look to see if there's any evidence of any head injury. And then as we've mentioned before, don't ever forget glucose. We want a capillary blood glucose from the nursing staff. In E, 
everything else as we've said it's a very broad differential so we're just kind of want a full top to toe examination examine their abdomen for any abdo pain or any evidence of urinary retention or any abdo tenderness suggestion of uti look for any rashes anywhere and then alongside our concern that patients might have had falls that we don't know about we're going to have a look for any evidence of trauma anywhere and um, skin tears or bruises or anything that's going to be our main examination. I've mentioned we're pretty much going to examine every system because they can all contribute to a reduced GCS, but putting a bit more focus on the neurological, given the given we're worried about possible intracerebral events. So now we'll talk a little bit about the investigations that we're doing in the acute setting. So we're going to split this up into bedside, bloods, and imaging. So at the bedside, we're going to want an ECG important in the context of possible stroke to look for AF. Also important if we're thinking about the patient might have had an acute coronary syndrome. If they've got a significantly reduced GCS and they're very unwell, it's a bit of a fact-finding process to try and work out what's gone on. So it's important to have an ECG. Um, next thing is a U and dip. Uh, UTIs are a very common cause of a delirium. So this is important for U and dip, and then we're likely going to send that off for a culture and then a capillary blood glucose at the bedside. In terms of bloods, we're going to do a full set of bloods. Uh, full blood count, we're going to be looking for raised white cell count, suggestive of an infection. We're going to look at the U's and E's for their hydration status, so an AKI suggestive of a sepsis or poor hydration or any electrolyte imbalance. With the same respect, doing a bone profile to look for electrolyte imbalance, particularly hypercalcemia, can cause confusion. Then we want a liver panel, liver function tests, helpful in the context of possible hepatic encephalopathy, which can cause confusion. And then we want a CRP, which will go with the white cell count to determine whether we think this is infection. And then a coag screen to have a look based on our concern about possible intracerebral bleed. In terms of imaging, we're going to get a chest x-ray in the unwell patient to have a look to see if there's a pneumonia or any evidence of heart failure that could cause a delirium. We're then likely going to need a CT head on a patient with an acutely reduced GCS. The urgency of this CT head is going to be determined by your assessment, how significant the reduction in GCS is, and whether there's anything else that could be causing it. So if we think the patient has a delirium secondary to a urine infection, and we're quite confident with that, then the CT head can likely be done on a non-urgent basis. If the patient's anticoagulated and has had a recent fall and head injury, and we're worried that they could be bleeding into the head, or if there's any focal neurology that would suggest a stroke or a bleed, then we're gonna want the CT head as urgent as possible. We're then going to think about, not in the acute setting, but in the more chronic setting on the ward, thinking about doing formal cognition assessments to help us monitor their cognition over time during the admission. So this can be MMSE or MOCA. And then we're going to think about other investigations if we're still not sure why the patient has a reduced GCS after all the above ones have been done. So thinking about an MRI head, after a CT head, if we're still not sure on the cause of the confusion or reduced GCS. We can think about lumbar puncture if we're worried about a meningitis or an encephalitis. And then in context of possible seizures, we can think about doing an EEG. So that's kind of how we're going to assess a patient presenting with reduced GCS. And hopefully after that, you would have an idea of what your differential diagnosis would be. We're going to talk now more in detail about um, some differentials. So the first one we're going to talk about is delirium. So this is defined as disturbed consciousness, cognitive function or perception of an acute onset and fluctuating course. And this is by and large the most common reason that patients are going to be confused when they come into hospital. The risk factors for this are pretty much most of the patients on the ward, so elderly, anyone with serious illness or significant comorbidity, polypharmacy, and then any history of previous or current cognitive impairment, so a dementia or a previous delirium. The presentation of delirium is 
that is acute and fluctuating. And there's two types. So the patient can be hyperactive or hypoactive, or they can have a mixed um, features of both. So delirium can cause altered perceptions or so hallucinations, visual or auditory. Um, deterioration in the physical function. So hyperactive patients might have restlessness, agitation, poor sleep, often sundown, and so become more agitated and distressed on an afternoon. Um, and then in a hypoactive patient, they might have reduced mobility, reduced movement, not getting out of bed, poor appetite. And then change in social behaviour as well. So a lack of cooperation with interventions. Hypoactive patients might become particularly withdrawn and then patients can have altered mood and or attitudes and often can become quite paranoid with a delirium. The management of a delirium in the initial setting, the main thing is to identify and treat the underlying cause, which as we've mentioned, how we assess the patient is how we're going to come to the conclusion on why we think they might have a delirium. We know we've got all these things going on and we want to have a look for all of these features. Um, and it's worth saying that it is helpful to try and prevent delirium before they happen. So we know these can all cause a patient to develop a delirium. So if we can try and prevent these happening when we see patients on the ward, that is obviously better. But yes, just looking for all these underlying causes and managing those um, as they appear is the mainstay of management. While we're waiting for that delirium to, be, to resolve, we're going to think about reorientation methods for the patient and de-escalation techniques if they're very agitated and then reinforcing sleep-wake cycles. So making sure the ward's nice and bright during the day, dark at night, keeping a lot of clocks around and avoiding patients sleeping during the day. In terms of pharmacological management, this is very rarely used. I myself have been working for three years and I don't think I've ever given anything for an acute delirium um, should only be used if the patient is a risk to himself or others and if your non-pharmacological methods haven't worked and then you're going to think about antipsychotics often the most commonly used would be in haloperidol acutely to try and settle the agitation we also want to think about a meds review which comes along with treating the underlying cause so looking at the patient's regular medications and see if there's anything that we need to stop or change because it's contributing to the confusion. In terms of prognosis of delirium, often what relatives will ask about their relative presenting with delirium. Generally, patients do recover over days to weeks, but some might never get back to their actual baseline cognition. Um, some may never recover at all, so we'll have a persistent cognitive impairment. Um, in which case they often need assessing for an underlying dementia after they've been discharged. And delirium is associated with prolonged hospital stays and increased morbidity and mortality. So as I said, if we can try and target these factors that contribute to it and avoid those, and that is better than treating it when it comes. So that's everything I'm going to say about delirium. Now we're going to have a bit of a talk about kind of intracerebral events, so stroke, ischemic stroke and intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, <clears throat> stroke is defined as a sudden onset focal neurological deficit of vascular etiology. To be defined definitely as a stroke, they have to have symptoms for over 24 hours. We obviously don't wait this long to treat the patients. So we can split these in, in ischemic and hemorrhagic and they have some similarities, but some differences. So risk factors are different for both. So ischemic stroke is, as we mentioned before, all of your vascular risk factors. And alongside that, AF with the risk of clots um, going off into the brain. And then the risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage are anticoagulation or other bleeding problems. So factor deficiencies, inherited uh, coagulopathies or uncontrolled severe hypertension and intracerebral aneurysms. For traumatic bleeds, obviously recent falls and trauma is what we want to think about in the risk factors. Presentation of them, they do have similarities, but some differences. So both of them can present with the reduced GCS and focal neurological signs. Ischemic stroke has quite defined syndromes for how the patients will present. I'm sure you sort of heard of these before, and if not, you can have a look at them in your own time. So total anterior strokes, partial anterior strokes, posterior circulation, and lacuna strokes. 
And because it's caused by a disruption of the blood supply affecting a specific territory of the brain, they have quite specific clinical features that you can pick up. It's a lot less specific for hemorrhage because it's not always a specific part of the brain that's affected. Um, so the focal neurology might be less focused on a specific part of the brain. And with intracerebral hemorrhage, it's more common um, than with ischemic that you'd see features of increased intracranial pressure. So headaches that have red flag factors, or headache post falls or trauma, or visual disturbance, such as blurred vision, or vomiting. We're going to worry about increased intracranial pressure, secondary to a bleed. So the acute management of both of these patients, if you suspect there's an intracranial event that has gone on when you've seen them with a reduced GCS, the first things you need to do as a junior doctor is put the patient on regular neuro observations and you want to be contacted if there's any deterioration in these. Keep the patient nil by mouth, penned in a swallow screen, as we know this can be affected in stroke, and organise an urgent CT head, which is obviously part of your investigations, but it's particularly of importance if you think the patient's had a stroke, we want the CT head as soon as possible. And the CT head findings are going to determine how we're going to manage the patient further. So there's three things that the CT head might show. It might show nil acute, it might show proven ischemia, it might show proven hemorrhage. If the CT head shows proven acute ischemia, we're going to load the patient with 300 milligrams of aspirin daily and discuss with the stroke team. If the CT head shows nil acute, but clinically the patient has features of acute stroke, we're going to have a think about the onset time. 4.5 hours is the, the time, the cutoff time. And that's the cutoff time for thinking about whether the patient would be for thrombolysis for their stroke. If you review a patient and you know they definitely have an onset time for their neurology and they're very confident and for stroke, we want the stroke team to be involved very early so that they can consider the patient for thrombolysis of their stroke. If the onset time is over four and a half hours or it's an unknown onset time, for example, the patient woke up on the morning or was seen on morning ward round and was last seen well the night before, then thrombolysis is not an option. And again, we would treat as ischemic stroke if the clinical su suspicion is high with 300 milligrams of aspirin. If the scan has a proven hemorrhage, we need to reverse any anticoagulation or correct any coagulopathies present, manage blood pressure, which can be very high because it's going to extend bleeding if it's extremely high. And then we need to refer to the neurosurgeons as to whether the patient would be for any surgical management of the bleeding. As I said before, throughout all of this, you're going to want to involve the stroke team. And if the patient has a proven stroke, one of the best methods of management is to admit the patient to a specialist stroke unit for specialist stroke rehabilitation. So that's all on stroke. We're just going to touch a little bit on hypoglycemia. Um, it's an important one not to miss. Uh, it's important one to know the management options for, uh, but it's quite quick to talk about. So blood glucose of less than four can definitely cause a reduced GCS. In the acute setting, if the patient is alert and their swallow is safe and it's just caused some confusion, you're going to give some oral glucose, quick acting, for example, glucogel or a sugary drink, and then follow that with some long acting carbohydrate to keep the sugars up. And then the other side of that is if they've got an unsafe swallow or they're unconscious and you can't give anything safely by mouth, you're going to administer IV glucose, usually would use 10%. Um, or if there's, and if there's no IV access, the blood sugar is not improving, you can also give IM glucagon. You're then going to reassess the patient, repeat the blood sugars and further treat as needed. If the patient's diabetic and on insulin, you're going to want to review their insulin, uh, not stop it altogether but make sure that the patient's not going to further go hypo and ask that to be reviewed by their usual team as soon as possible. Just thought it was worth mentioning hypoglycemia because it's quite an important one to know. So that's all we're going to talk about. So kind of in summary, for the patient with a reduced GCS, this is an extremely common presentation and you'll definitely be asked to see it. 
and it has quite a broad range of differentials affecting all the different systems. So it's really important to do a full top to toe review and assessment of the patient and full set of investigations. Delirium is the most common cause that a patient will be newly confused. Um, and the mainstay of managing that will be to treat the underlying cause. Um, and in the meantime, reorientation methods. And then if the patient has a suspected intracranial event, i.e. mainly any fo new focal neurology, recent head injury, or significant reduction in their GCS with features of raised intracranial pressure, you're gonna want an urgent CT head regular new observations. And then once you have the CT head, you can manage that depending on the pathology found. That's all. Um, this is pre-recorded, so I can't answer any questions, but I'm sure Sandeep will give contact numbers if anyone has any questions or wants the notes for the kind of what I've spoke about today from the bottom of the slides. That's absolutely fine. Thank you.